Thanks very much for having me. Thanks everybody for joining who's joining and thanks especially to Marco and Fabrizio for organizing and to Dan Lindley and Alfredo for commenting. So I'm looking forward to your comments and I hope it's going to be a great and interesting session. So as I already said, my paper is called On the Mechanistic Triad and I just want to give you, wait, yeah, there we go. I just want to give you a little bit of a background on like how this project started and what it is. So I first started thinking about this topic when I read Carl's and Lindley's book in 2014. And then the project took more shape as I was at a book symposium where I was fortunate enough to give a commentary and get Lindley's and Carl's feedback. And what you hear today is something like version, I don't know, five, six of this. So I'm especially honored to also hear what Lindsay has to say about how the project has developed in a while. The theme I'm going to be engaging with is the question of how these different kinds of mechanisms, and this is a photo from Lindsay's and Carl's book, and they call it different kinds of mechanisms, how these different kinds of mechanisms connect. So the central issue I'm going to be talking about today is how do these producing, underlying, and maintaining mechanisms to link up with one another. Um, why should we bother with this question to begin with? Well, one of the central things when we think of mechanistic explanation, is, especially in subject areas such as the life sciences, is that we often have to integrate results and explanations from different disciplines and at what scientists might call different levels, or philosophers might call it different levels and scientists not so much. And when we think about the relation between such different mechanisms that are differently structured, I think there are two issues that complicate the question that are worth mentioning before we start. So one being that philosophers often talk about different kinds of mechanisms, but sometimes in the literature we also find distinctions between different readings of mechanisms between the different aspects of mechanisms or between different types of mechanisms. And it's not so clear what those are supposed to be and what the relation is. So what exactly is it that, that's supposed to connect here? And when we ask that question, the second issue comes up, namely, um, is this actually a question about metaphysics? Is it a question about discovery or is it a question about explanation? And in the mechanistic literature, these three issues tend to be run together. And it's not an accident that they are, because they are, first of all, conceptually closely tied together. And second, there is a central issue that's important in all three cases. So whether we discuss mechanistic explanations, mechanism discovery, or the metaphysics of mechanisms. In all cases, we're interested in the exact relation between phenomena and the mechanisms that are supposed to explain the phenomenon. So let me briefly say something on the relation between discovery and explanation. Since the book that Lindley and Carl wrote is primarily about discovery, and discovery as they construe it, at least how I read it, is that discovery is basically the construction of scientific, uh, of mechanistic explanations. So, Mechanistic explanations, we could say, are the outcome of discovery. And that's something that's shared with other mechanists in the literature. If you look, for instance, at Patel and Richardson, 2010, Discovering Complexity, then you also find the statement that discovery in the life sciences is basically the development of mechanistic explanations. So discovery and explanation are inextricable inextricably linked and the same set of norms applies to both. Thus, the triad, it seems to me, is as much about discovery as it is about explanation. And though I know that at least for one of the authors of Cards and Lindley's book, there is an ontic conception in the background there, I really want to focus on explanation here. As 
think you can read pretty much all of what I'm saying also ontically, but you don't have to commit to that if you're looking into the connection between these different kinds of explanations. So for me, I'm going to focus on different kinds of explanations that emphasize different aspects or different metaphysical relations of the causal mechanical structure of the world. And which aspects are emphasized, that's going to be my central claim, depends on the kind of phenomenon we are trying to explain. So what sort of explanation would take? In a way, I can't help but think of this similar as the Hindu concept of Trimurti, where we have the three forms, each in charge of different aspects, the so three different gods, each in, each in charge of different aspects of creation. Brahma creates, Vishnu preserves, and Shiva destroys. And these three gods just represent fundamental forces in the universe and embody different aspects of ultimate reality. The point is, however, not that we have these three gods. The point is that you need all three to keep the, to keep the world going round. And I want to claim that with mechanistic explanation, it's sort of the same. Depending on what we want to explain, we need these different aspects and we need these different sorts of explanation. So here's the gist of what I'm going to be arguing. Different kinds of explanations and different discovery projects embody different research questions and thus aim to explain different kinds of phenomena. The explanandum relates to the mechanism that's supposed to explain it in different ways and discovery thus focuses on different metaphysical relations. It seeks to uncover different relations in the world that answer these research questions. And that's then what we cite in our mechanistic explanation. And even though all of these are closely tied together. Now you see again, we have these different aspects, the metaphysics, we have the explanation and discovery, all of the three in here. Still the question is how do we integrate across this triad, this mechanistic triad of underlying producing and maintaining. All right, let's get started. Um, the plan for today is that I'm first going to tell you a little bit about mechanism discovery and I'm going to start from how Lindley and Colton screw it in the in the book, in the 2013 book. And then I'm going to talk to you about these three kinds of explanation that I think that these different kinds of mechanistic explanations have. And then specifically, I'm going to focus on maintaining mechanisms then when discussing the different sorts of integration that we might have, how we might link those different kinds of mechanisms up with one another. All right, so let's get going with the mechanisms. I don't think the mechanistic approach needs much of an introduction here. But just for the sake of completeness, I include one, what we might call consensus view, which is sort of a, yeah, it's a conjunction of some of what Hillary and Williamson and some of Glennon have said as, or have presented as a consensus view. Mechanism for a phenomenon consists of entities or parts whose activities and interactions are organized such that they are responsible for the phenomenon to be explained. So, What's important about this definition is that two important relations are left unspecified, and it's purposefully so. First, we have different kinds of organizations, so the relation between components. And second, we have different kinds of responsibility. So that's the phenomenon mechanism relation, and that's what I'm going to be looking in more throughout the talk. However, I think that they are they are closely tied together. So depending on what kind of phenomenal mechanism relation we have, we will focus on a certain kind of organizational relation or relation between entities. And the fact that we have these, this ambiguity in the definition is really not a bug, it's a feature. It provides shelter for all of these three here. So we have the producing mechanism, the underlying mechanism, and the maintaining mechanism. So let's start with the producing mechanism. Producing or etiological mechanisms are basically causal change. And being responsible for, in this case, means to cause. So what we're trying to explain is the final outcome or the end product. Then the probably most familiar picture is this, where we have constitutive mechanisms. This, this diagram is from Trader 2007. 
here a different aspect of the world is being em emphasized, i.e. the constitutive aspect. And the constitutive relevance relation is a relation that obtains between the phenomenon as a whole and its individual component parts. The mechanism, so that's the whole collection of parts and their activities at the bottom, the, the behavior of that overall me mechanism is the phenomenon that's supposed to be explained. So that's the top circle, now in pink. From here, we can now go on to the third kind of mechanism, maintaining mechanism. Maintaining mechanisms are responsible for something stable. They emphasize the, continu the continuity, a continuous aspect, ongoing phenomena, the steadiness of a phenomenon. And what we're trying to explain here is the thing in the middle, the thing that's being maintained. And the arrows pointing away from and back into it are forces and disturbances that act on this phenomenon or so at least in this representation. All right, so far so good. Now, how do we find these things? In search of mechanisms, Carlos Lindley described discovery as a four-step process. We basically start with the characterization of a phenomenon, when then we construct a sketch of the mechanism, gradually develop it further and further into a schema, that may still be abstract, but we keep on filling it in. It doesn't have any missing pieces at this point. We evaluate that schema, and then we re revise it, and we go back, maybe have to change the phenomenon characterization. It's like a loop. We go through these four steps until we reach a complete explanation. While that sounds pretty much universal, Colin Bentley actually describes different discovery strategies for the different kinds of mechanisms that they list. So here's what they say, page 65, abstract guidance for mechanism schema construction comes from the decision about whether one is seeking a mechanism that produces, maintains, or underlies a phenomenon. So again, there is something ontic in the background here when we talk about mechanistic explanations rather than mechanisms themselves. I don't think we have to commit to that, but I don't want to get into this debate here. Um, and again, it's important to notice that, what, that the important question is, well, what determines what kind of mechanism we seek? I would say it's the kind of research question we are asking and the kind of phenomenon we're trying to explain. So let's see how Colin Lindley spelled this out. In the case of an underlying mechanism, that they say, one typically breaks the system as a whole into component parts that one takes to be working components in a mechanism, and one shows how they are organized together spatially, temporally, and actively, such that they give rise to the phenomenon as a whole. So the emphasis here is on components, on entities, and on their organization. And discovery is a process, partly at least, that works by decomposition. So that's a central feature of discovering underlying mechanisms. A familiar example is the action potential. So here's the simplified textbook story. We have a resting state where the membrane potential is minus 70 millivolt. Then we have a depolarization. So you can basically follow through here stages one through well, five and then back to one. If above threshold, then we get to the rising phase. So if the depolarization is above threshold, then we get sodium influx. We get all the way to the peak at almost 50 millivolts. Then we have the falling phase. Potassium goes out of the cell again. There's an, this undershoot, which you see here marked with five. And then the sodium potassium pump reduces the, uh, restores the rest of potential. And this is a pretty plausible story for an underlying mechanism. So if we take the action potential as a whole, in the few milliseconds that it takes, we have all of these different components engaging in these different activities, and that's what we would cite in an explanation that uses an underlying mechanism. How about producing mechanisms? Here's what Corey and Lindsay say about those. Again, the characterization is pretty plausible. 
In case of a productive mechanism, one typically starts with some understanding of the end product and seeks the components that are assembled and the processes by which they are assembled and the activities that transform them on the way to the final stage. So the emphasis here is on components, again, and these activities and their organization. But now we are looking at successive stages rather than component parts. And now it's more of a diachronic rather than a synchronic picture. So the explanandum is the thing that's in the end, not the thing that all of this together brings about. A paradigm example for, as a paradigm example for this, we might consider gene expression or protein synthesis, where we ask about how did the protein come to be in the cell? Well, first DNA was transcribed, then RNA, RNA was translated, then the amino acid chain was folded, and finally we had the protein. So we have these several successive stages, and there's a causal process that's continuing through. Right, finally, how about maintenance mechanisms? In the case of a maintenance mechanism, one typically needs to characterize some process or property that is maintained at a given speed or level. One needs to recognize the forces that tend to move the system away from the, the homeostatic point and the processes by which those divergences are detected and or corrected. So those are the arrows pointing away and back into the black circle in the middle. What could be a plausible example for this? Well, one pretty useful and example from the life sciences is the resting membrane potential. And the question, well, how come we have this stable resting membrane potential? Well, on this, there's an action potential, obviously. So there's a negative charge of intracellular fluid due to different ion concentrations in the inside and the outside of the cell. And since there are only a few channels open, let's for now, for illustration purposes, just focus on, so on sodium and potassium. So we have um, lots of potassium inside the cell and little outside. So there are certain diffusion forces and electrical forces working here, and they are equal. So there's not, not so much leakage. Then we have sodium ions, where we have lots outside and little inside. So both forces, electrical force and diffusion force, now drive sodium into the cell, but fewer channels are open. So just all, all in all, we can say that there are just 4% of the leakage of potassium for the sodium ions. To correct for this leakage, the cell membrane engages a sodium-potassium pump, which changes three sodium ions that it pumps out for two potassium ions that it pumps in. This is also the way that we restore the resting membrane potential after the action potential. But for now, let's just focus on the resting membrane potential as it is being maintained regardless of the action potential. So I hope this was somewhat clear. I can't see any of you. I'm happy to go back to this during discussion. But the point really is, well, there is some stuff happening and we are correcting for this in order to maintain a stable state. Okay, so far so good. All of this seems empirically quite plausible and useful, but the question still is, how do these different mechanisms that we have discovered with these different discovery strategies and the different explanations we construct for these different phenomena, how can we relate those? So I'm completely on board with all of what I recited from Carmen Lindley so far. And the question really is, okay, what, what, what else is there and how can we bring these three kinds of mechanistic explanations together? And this is, by the way, I think I haven't said that yet. That's what I call the mechanistic triad. So, Karin and Lindley say that, that these different discovery strategies yield different mechanistic explanations. And what I add to this is saying that these different mechanistic explanations are different or can be distinguished by the phenomenon mechanism relations that we have. So the relation between the explanants and the explanando. They 
And if we have different explananda, our explanants will emphasize different kinds of relations in the world. You could also say we carve out the causal mechanical structure of the world in different ways. And the reason for this, I claim, is that our explanations, as I already said, take different kinds of phenomena as explananda. That why, depending on or depending on what kind of phenomenon we want to explain, we end up with different kinds of mechanistic explanations and we describe different mechanisms in those explanations. So that takes me to the third uh, to the next section to the three explananda. So if we have these different kinds of responsibility, these different phenomenal mechanism relations, and they are usually accompanied by different structures of explanations that can be reflected by the different types of organization in which the diagrams, which are shown in the diagrams, then again, that, that's the mechanistic triad. And I suggest that for each element of the mechanistic triad, we have specific explanations. Let's review the example. So first, I talked about the action potential. The action potential was had an underlying mechanism, or is explained by an underlying mechanism. And the explanandum here is the behavior of the mechanism as a whole. So we can say the phenomenon is the behavior of the mechanism as a whole, a temporally extended but finite process. So the thing here up on the bottom, uh, on, on the top, sorry. What does the explaining in this case? Well, it's the components, the entities and activities, and how they are organized, how they work together, the activities, so on and so forth. Second case, gene expression. Gene expression or protein synthesis, we ask for how the protein comes to be in the cell, and we cite the causal process that led to that result. So what's the explanandum? Again, it's the end product of final stage. And what does the explaining well, it's the causal chain, the productive process leaving, leading up to that product or final stage. And there are several stages over time. So again, this is more, it's more of a diachronic, the underlying is more of a synchronic picture. Okay. Third case, the resting membrane potential. Here, how is, the, how it, is how is it maintained? And what, well, the question is how is it maintained? The explanandum is the stable potential, the stable intracellular charge. So we can say what's the explanandum? Well, a homeostatic point, this might be a stable property such as uh, the resting membrane potential, the charge there, or it might also be a continuing process, something that we find in, say, circadian rhythms, where the the wake and night phases are shifting regularly back and forth, and this regular shifting between wake and, uh, wake and sleep, that's being maintained. What does the explaining in that case? So what's the explanation? Well, it's the feedback loops, the forces pushing the phenomenon away from the homeostatic point, and then the processes that correct for them again. And this is pretty much a back and forth as you can also see in the picture. All right, so where exactly does all of this leave us with regard to the relation between these different kinds of, well, phenomena and mechanistic explanations? Because I said in the beginning, I'm interested in the question, okay, what's, what's the difference between these elements of the triad and then how can we bring them together if we want to link them, if we want to integrate them? Let's first look at underlying and producing mechanisms. Those are pretty well understood, and one of my colleagues from Bochum actually pointed out that a lot of what I'm saying in this section already falls out of the mechanistic account as we know it. So produce and underline, uh, producing and underlying mechanisms are rather easy to connect. Still, I think it's important to see that they emphasize different aspects, so the causal and the constitutive aspect of the world. And 
bear with me because all of what I'm saying is going to feed into my analysis of maintenance later on. So for illustration, consider lactose metabolism in the E. coli. This is a well-known regulatory thing, and we can ask different questions about lactose metabolism. For instance, we can just ask, okay, normally the preferred sugar is glucose. When that's unavailable, E. coli splits lactose into glucose and galactose, but as long as as long as lactose is absent, the genes coding the relevant enzymes are not transcribed, how does all of that work? And then our mechanistic, underlying mechanistic explanation will cite all of these different elements, the repressor, the genes, the promoter, the transcription, and all of that. It's all going to be in the elements. Now, when lactose is present, the whole thing looks a little bit different. We now now we have the RNA polymerase going along the genes. Lact operon is being transcribed, and lactose is being digested. As a result, we end up with simple sugars in the cell. So lactose is split into glucose and galactose. The precise details of the different, yeah, the, the precise details here of the molecules and so doesn't don't matter so much for current purposes. What I what I want to emphasize here is that we can ask two different questions about lactose metabolism if we, if we are seeking different kinds of explanations. So the first question is, how do we end up with glucose and galactose from lactose? And this is the question about the end product, the question for which we would look for producing mechanism. Now, likewise, we can ask, if it's more generally, how is lactose metabolized? And if we're asking that question, we're focusing on the overall pro process of lactose digestion, and we're more looking for constitutive, for constitutive features, and we'll end up with an underlying mechanism explaining how lactose is being meta metabolized. Note there that here we just have different explanatory goals, given that different sorts of phenomena are being explained should be explained. So we have different explanander here marked in red. How do we end up with glucose and galactose? We're looking for the end product. How is lactose metabolized? We're looking for the overall behavior of the mechanism. Just putting it back in pictures. The crux now is if we can look at me lactose metabolism in these different ways, we're still studying just one mechanism of lactose metabolism. There's not two, and it would be useful to be able to link them if we are seeking a larger scale explanation, if we're trying to situate, say, research on RNA polymerase with research on the enzyme splitting lactose in the end. And one obvious way to integrate these producing and underlying mechanisms is by just plugging them into one another. We can locate production within an underlying mechanism. So here we have the producing chain that is within the underlying mechanism. So we could say, if this is lactose metabolism, this would be the simple, simple sugar or the enzyme splitting uh, splitting lactose at some point, and then it's being active, and we have the simple sugars. So that, that's pretty straightforward. Another way to link up the two would be to analyze lactose metabolism in stages. So we would look at the productive mechanism, so our three blobs that had the red blob in the end, and then we can analyze each of the stages mechanistically looking at the underlying mechanism. So what's underlying, say, the binding of RNA polymerase, or what's underlying the folding of the protein that makes for the enzyme in the end? So we could kind of take the productive mechanism. So this is, this is our productive mechanism then 
decompose each, each, each stage and look for what's underlying it. But then in that case, we would be switching from explaining the end product over here to explaining what's happening at the different stages. But still, it's a good way to integrate, to link the two. So putting all of this together, we could then come up with a larger mechanism drawing where we incorporate these two things. So on the one end, we have lactose metabolism as a whole, and we have the different things that are underlying it. Among them, there's this causal process that, say, produces um, the enzyme splitting lactose in the end. And then we can have different exonanda, which then would be components in this larger scale underlying mechanism. And one of them could be, for instance, how lactose is being split into glucose and galactose. So when we look at this drawing of the, of the luck operon, we can just ask about different things. Just like in the case of the action potential, we can ask for an explanation of how the overall process works. We'll get an explanation describing an underlying mechanism, or we can ask for how the end product, glucose and galactose, were generated. And we'll, that'll be an explanation that's from the structure very similar to how proteins are being synthesized. Now, Again, it's important to know, just because we have these different takes and we ask these different questions, doesn't make I'm duplicating the structure here. It's still just one lactose metabolism. So far, so good. This was all about producing an underlying mechanism. So how about maintaining mechanisms? And now it's all a little less obvious. So maintaining mechanisms I think are really interesting. And unfortunately, they are really understudied in the mechanistic literature. There just isn't that much on maintaining mechanisms. Also in this new book on the new mechanical philosophy, Stuart Glennon only mentions them in passing in his taxonomy. And unfortunately, there just isn't a lot of attention. And I think it's well worth looking at maintaining mechanisms in more detail. So let's do that. Maintaining mechanisms, as I already said, has as their explanando the thing that's being maintained. So, for instance, it's a, it could be a stable property like a stable body temperature, or it could be a continuing process such as circadian rhythms. And to achieve that, we can explain this stable state in the middle here, or this continuing process, we often have feedback loops going on. And an important feature of this drawing, I think, is that it collapses over time. Already the producing, producing and maintaining mechanism sketches, sketches now in the like graphical notion of mechanism sketch, already those, those illustrations of producing and underlying mechanisms are somewhat static and are not representing time. But for maintaining mechanisms, it seems like this is a lot more essential. So let's consider the luck operon again. Actually, we also have a maintaining aspect here. Namely, we can ask how the levels of enzymes are kept in equilibrium with the levels of lactose so that no energy is wasted and the repressors inhibit the repressors will inhibit protein production or enzyme production whenever we don't need them or rather E. coli doesn't need them. So how is this equilibrium maintained? There, that's the maintaining aspect in this lactose metabolism. And how does this fit with the underlying and the producing stories. So first, I want to look at 
maintenance once more and emphasize another factor. So I already mentioned the diagrams collapse over time and yet the explanandum is the little blob in the middle. Now in this diagram I changed the representation of the forces shifting the uh, shifting the phenomenon away from and back to or shifting the system rather away from and back to its equilibrium point. So I think the most well the best the best way to make sense of this I can think of is to think of this in terms of causal chains that are going from the phenomenon and back to the phenomenon. And if this is so, we might as well change the representation. So basically, if you compare these arms over here with this, with these three that I left as in the original, the main thing that has been changed is that it's not just one element, but now the feedback chains are longer. They have three or two elements. And if we adopt that representation, we can also un unfold it over time. And I'm doing this with the pictures because that's, I think, the easiest way to illustrate what's going on. So if we unfold it over time, we have a repetitive production. We have the phenomenon here, the stable property or the continuous process, then something is happening and it's produced again. Then something else is happening and it's produced again. And this keeps going as we, well, look over time. So basically what we get is a repetitive or a continuing production. And each time the phenomenon occurs, it's actually being produced. So if we just looked at that section, it would just look like a producing mechanism, or that section would also just look like a producing mechanism. There's an alternative, so that, that's, one, that's one way to sort of translate maintaining into productive talk. And then that also gives us a straightforward way to link, well, productive mechanisms with maintaining mechanisms. However, there's an alternative reading. We could also think of a maintaining mechanism as maintaining a phenomenon, a continuing behavior that needs to be actively upheld. So in that case, think of, for instance, circadian rhythms. We need to actively uphold that, that, that rhythm, that rhythm over time. Or think of homeostasis. We need to actively do something to keep our body temperature stable. It's pretty hot in Germany right now. So what my body does is it's uses its cooling mechanisms to keep my body temperature where it should be so that I don't overheat. When it's cold in the winter, well, it's using the heating system so that I don't freeze. There are multiple forces at work here, and these forces are now components in the mechanism that influence one another. It's just change in representation, really. It depends on what it is that we're trying to explain and how that relates to what does the explaining. So we can think of the factors or the, we can think of the forces that are acting on the phenomenon as components in an underlying mechanism. And they not only mutually influence one another, we can also mechanistically further analyze them. So each of these components can be given again an analysis in terms of an underlying mechanism. So now we have sort of everything in this picture. We have the phenomenon that's being maintained by the interacting forces. Some of this is a productive chain. And then the element can be decomposed and we can find the underlying mechanisms again. And now we see how all three kinds of mechanisms work together and how we can integrate them with one another. Just to see this again, another way we could think of this switch from one sort of a maintaining interpretation to the other would be to plug these chains in here and consider the phenomenon input and output to the system. And this then being the regularly regular, uh, the regular maintaining system. 
alternatively in this present, uh, representation. These guys, and whether we analyze these further or these would be the same story. But the externandum is different, namely in that case here, it's the overall phenomenon over time. It's finite, but the complete process. And here the externandum would be the output of the mechanism. And it's a question of what I'm interested in, what sort of question I'm asking, whether this or this will be the correct or the most adequate mechanistic explanation. So what does all of this tell us about maintenance then altogether? How should we deal with it? Well, maintenance highlights the continuity and regulatory features. It acknowledges that we have contributing forces that act over time. So that's, that's I think, the most important addition when we discuss maintaining mechanisms, that we move away from this stable, synchronous, everything's in just one picture view, even though the representation that we started with is just this blob in the middle and the forces, it like puts everything together. We can think of maintenance as a special kind of production that is repetitive, that occurs over and over again, or we can think of it as a continuing behavior when we think of it as a special kind of underlying mechanism that keeps going over and over. Now, to this suggestion, I want to raise two worries and also reply to them. So the first worry one could raise is that now if you have this representation here on the right, then your forces are no longer actually acting on the phenomenon and I have switched the kind of description. So I'm not no longer actually using the same sort of phenomenon mechanism relation here. My reply to this objection is that they are. So the forces are still relevant to, responsible for our overall mechanism behavior. It's just implicit now in the underlying relation. Because just as components in an underlying mechanism are relevant for the behavior of an overall mechanism, these components here, the forces, are relevant to the phenomenon. The second worry might be that mechanisms don't actually, that maintaining mechanisms don't actually add anything because we can construe them as either producing or underlying mechanisms anyway. My reply to this is, however, that they highlight continuity and that that is an important addition as it highlights the temporal dimension. It highlights that it's important to consider time and sometimes it's also important to, inter to look at the interaction of the different forces over time. That's something I cover in the paper, but I cut out of the presentation for the sake of time, but I'm happy to go there in the Q&A. So one way to put this would be to say that maintaining mechanisms emphasize sort of a different dimension for classifying mechanistic explanations. We already know this familiar distinction between etiological or causal and constitutive mechanisms and I've argued at length now that they just take different that they are just different ways of looking at the world that, that we carve the world in different ways and that they have different phenomena as their explananda. Now we can use that distinction between etiological and constitutive mechanisms as one axis and then just add on the second axis the iterative counterparts as the two sorts of maintaining or my two analyses of maintaining mechanisms. So we have the non-iterative producing and underlying mechanisms and we have the iterative and continuing maintaining mechanisms that can either emphasize etiological or constitutive features. All right, where does all of this leave us then? Well, I started with this with this picture with the triad that Craver and Darden present, and the question: How do the different elements of the triad? How do these three kinds of mechanisms actually connect with one another? My conclusions are that scientists discover and reason about mechanisms in various ways, and they ask different research questions and seek different 
di different sorts of explanations for different kinds of explananda. Explaining different phenomena, overall processes, and products, continuing behaviors, or stable states, just emphasize different aspects, the underlying producing or the con continuous or maintaining aspect of the causal me mechanical structure of the world. And ideally, we would get all of them in a big, what Carl Craver calls mechanism mosaic in the end. They are not in opposition, but they actually complement one another. And one way in thinking about, or one way to think about the relation between these different sorts of mechanistic explanations is that they are a result of how we look at the world, how we carve up the world in different ways. It's important, again, that maintaining mechanisms add to our understanding the temporal dynamics of mechanistic, well, of mechanism operation. And it's also important that throughout their, throughout their research or throughout the, the larger research projects, scientists often naturally flip back and forth between different kinds of research questions and different explanatory well, and discovery strategies. And that we have different phenomena mechanism relations is just a natural corollary of this. For instance, if you consider the discovery of lactose metabolism and then the investigation of how does this actually work, you will have had scientists at one point focus on, oh, well, how does this overall process work? And then at another point, well, how do they keep that regulatory, how do they keep that regulatory system in place? And then at another point, you, they will have wondered, okay, how is that one protein actually, or that enzyme actually produced and when, how, is, how is that how does the system make sure that the repress is being removed at the right spot? And all of these are different explananda. And all of these need to be linked together to understand how the overall system works. To achieve this sort of integration, to put everything together in a mechanism mosaic, we thus need to link the different kinds of mechanistic explanations we have. And I've demonstrated, at least in part, hopefully, how this works. Again, I can't really help thinking of it other than in this way, with a link to the Trimurti. In, if you're Hindu, then which of the three gods you worship at any given time will depend on the very purpose at hand. It doesn't depend well, it's not that one is in totally better or absolutely best than the others. You need all three to keep the world going. And just as well, if you want to construct bigger, larger scale mechanistic mosaic explanations, you have to sometimes link maintaining, underlying, and producing mechanisms. And with that, I'm at the end of the presentation, and I would thank you all very much, and I'm looking forward to the comments. Thank you.